Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor to join you at the Global Ethics Forum where we gather to reflect on the pressing issues of our time and explore the transformative potential of emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence. As we discuss the Ford Industrial Revolution and its impact on humanity, one question resonates deeply. Can artificial intelligence, one of the most powerful technologies of our times, be harnessed to promote peace and uphold human rights and dignity? We are at a crossroads where emerging technologies can either widen the divide between us or help bridge them meaningfully, fostering a more just, peaceful, and inclusive world. AI, with its vast capabilities, offers us the chance to do just that. Artificial intelligence has a potential to be a sentinel of peace. Algorithms can analyze vast amounts of data to detect early signs of unrest, conflicts, before they escalate into violence. By real-time monitoring social media, economic indicators, and political developments, AI can alert us to rising tensions and provide insights on how to escalate them and facilitate for our governments and organizations to intervene before tension escalates. In countries ravaged by war, AI-powered drones are being utilized for humanitarian missions, delivering supplies to inaccessible regions. These advancements reflect a potent vision of AI as a tool for peace. This is not just a futuristic vision. It is a reality that is within our grasp. Moreover, appropriate use of AI and AI-powered tools and services can facilitate constructive and evidence-driven dialogue between conflicting parties. Through real-time translation and communication platforms powered by AI, we can bridge linguistic and cultural divides, evidence-based approaches, anticipation and insights, enabling more effective negotiations and fostering constructive, meaningful and solutions-focused dialogue among diverse communities. AI can help us find meaningful and responsive common ground, even in the most challenging of circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen and excellencies, furthermore, artificial intelligence potential to protect human rights is equally profound. In regions of the world where human rights monitors cannot be present, AI can act as their eyes and ears by analyzing satellite imagery, video footages, and other forms of data, AI can detect and document human rights violations in real time. This capability is crucial for holding perpetrators accountable and ensuring that justice is served. But AI's role in def is defending human rights goes beyond surveillance. It can also help us reform our legal systems. By analyzing legal decisions, AI can identify patterns of discrimination and biases, ensuring that everyone, regardless of their background, received fair treatment under the law. AI can help us build where justice is not a privilege, but a universal right. AI can also play a pivotal role in empowering vulnerable and marginalized communities. Consider the millions of people around the world who struggle to access justice because they lack the resources or knowledge to navigate complex platforms. AI-driven tools such as chatbots and legal advisory platforms, as well as knowledge platforms, can provide these individuals with the information and support they need to claim their rights. However, as we celebrate the potential of AI, we must also acknowledge challenges it presents. It is no secret that the question of whether AI can meaningfully promote peace and uphold human rights is a complex one that requires a multilateral approach, guidance, commitment, and leadership, particularly 
the urgent need for a response and role of the Human Rights Council and its mechanism. The same technologies that promote to uplift societies can also be weaponized, amplifying existing inequalities and infringing upon individual rights. Surveillance systems powered by AI can lead to oppressive regimes monitoring their citizens, stifling dissent and curtailing freedoms. AI is a powerful tool, but it's not neutral. The algorithms that govern these systems reflect the virtues and or biases of those who design and deploy them, perpetuating systemic inequities. We must also be vigilant against the risks of AI reinforcing existing inequalities and biases. The digital divide remains a significant barrier to realizing AI's full potential for peace and human rights. We must work together to ensure AI benefits all of humanity, not just a privileged few. Therefore, it is our responsibility to ensure that AI is guided by ethical principles that prioritize human dignity, fairness, and inclusivity, and we must commit to meaningfully close the digital divide. Thus, the centrality of the role and response of the Human Rights Council with the appropriate mechanisms in place is urgent and required. To ensure that the fourth industrial revolution is responsive meaningfully to human dignity, we must adopt an inclusive and holistic approach anchored in meaningful collaborations that is, that is multi-sectoral and intergovernmental. Governments, industries or private sector, civil society and academia, youth and women must all come together to establish ethical frameworks that govern the development and deployment of AI technologies. We need policies that prioritize inclusivity, transparency and accountability and a multilaterally driven mechanisms and processes and frameworks for data governance and AI governance. Furthermore, AI powered educational platforms can offer personalized learning experiences, breaking down barriers to education and providing opportunities for all. We must equip our future generation with the skills to navigate and shape a tech driven world by democratizing access to knowledge, information and resources and closing the digital divide. AI can help lift people out of poverty and give them the tools to participate fully in their societies. This includes fostering a deeper understanding of AI's implications on societies and engaging in critical discussions about its ethical use. Ladies and gentlemen and excellencies, a call for action. In conclusion, the fourth industrial revolution driven by AI offers us unprecedented opportunities to promote peace and protect human rights and achieve human dignity. But these opportunities comes with a profound responsibility. Our collective strength lies in our diversity by actively including voices from the global South, vulnerable and marginalized communities in the conversations and input and decisions around AI we can create solutions that truly and meaningfully reflect our shared humanity. We must advocate to adaptive policies that meaningfully protect human rights, promote social equity, and ensure that technology serves all of humanity, not just a privileged few. We must harness AI with wisdom and foresight, ensuring that it serves the greater good and human dignity. Let us commit to using AI, not as a tool of division, but as a force of unity. Let us work together to build a world where AI serves with adequate guardrails, all of humanity, where peace, human rights, and human dignity are not just ideals, but realities and a commitment for all. Let us collectively harness the promise and power of AI to uplift the human spirit and promote global unity, build a future where AI enhances our collective dignity and fosters a world 
where the culture of peace and peace reigns for all and everywhere. As I conclude once again, I leave you with a quote from Pope Francis's AI speech he delivered on 14 June, 2024 in Puglia. And I quote, it is up to everyone to make good use of artificial intelligence, but the onus is on politics to create the conditions for such good use to be possible and fruitful. I thank you and wish you all a productive Global Ethics 2024 conference and engagement. Thank you so much. Ambassador Ka from the Gambia. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues here in Geneva and online, welcome. This is the final day for Global Ethics Forum 2024 and the first of three panels on AI. Lots to talk about, although I think it's gonna be a hard act to follow what we, what we just heard. Um, let's, um, well, my, I, let's begin with some introductions. Uh, I'm Paul Martins, Baylor University, and I'm the director of the uh, Baylor Ethics Initiative. We have some strengths in bioethics, ethical leadership, and some other things, but inevitably, like all of us, AI creeps up on you very quickly, and suddenly you're scrambling to try to figure out what are we doing with AI? This panel here, they're all accomplished scholars in this field, and uh, I look forward to the contributions they have to make. Let's, let's just go down the row here. Um, Wallace Chang, please feel free to just introduce yourself, okay. where you're from. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. As of before, um, uh, my self-introduction, I just want to, uh, to say that uh, uh, Dr. Pavan uh, Duga, one of our board members already uh, was invited to this panel, but he's stuck in, uh, in uh, India. So we will upload his video uh, to the website, also the uh, event uh, app, so you can follow up on that. Uh, myself, I was uh, a trained economist with uh, humanitarian and development focus. I have been working on international trade, uh, development, food security, and finally AI and digital transformation. Uh, I'm also a professional fundraiser. Uh, this is a very interesting job. I love it. I am very grateful to many uh, partners, sponsors, philanthropists for a shared journey in the past two decades and uh, ongoing one. I, uh, just feel free to contact me if you want to continue to uh, this partnership, enhance this partnership, particularly on AI and digital ethics uh, for inclusive future. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Alexander Krivitz. I'm based at the Technical University of Munich, Institute of Ethics and Artificial Intelligence. And we have started, I would say, five years ago to delve deeper into the topic of AI and human rights. And the corner we came from is actually business ethics, uh, which deals with the responsibilities corporations have when basically being placed in an international diverging landscape in terms of laws and regulation. And the core focus of business ethics has always been in a way to understand what companies and enterprises are doing in environments which are not really regulated. So from that point of view, we encountered the tendency of AI really reshaping the world in terms of the human rights landscape and also potential adverse impacts created by AI. So we took on the mission also to get a better understanding of what, in a way, business and human rights means in the context of AI. And for this purpose, we have organized in July a summit on AI and human rights in order to provide some sort of draft convention, which in a way maps AI and human rights and gives some implications of what organizations ought to do in terms of navigating human rights when using, developing, or deploying artificial intelligence. Thank you. We'll come back to that, definitely. Lucia. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lucia Bosoer. Um, I come from Argentina, but currently I work in the chair on artificial intelligence and democracy, uh, which is based in the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. And I will tell you more about what we do there, uh, I think, uh, in, the, in the next hour. So thank you very much for the invitation. Excellent. Excellent. Glad you're all here. Alex, you get the first question. Um, this convention on AI data and, and human rights, it seems to me we met about two months ago to, to discuss this for the first time and, and you've worked on it since then. Um, it seems, is it fair to say that 
you are concerned that there are some serious human rights violations, at least possible, if not already in action through AI. Is that is that fair to say? And if so, what are those? Absolutely. I think you're addressing a very like important point because like over the past, I would say perhaps let's even say 10 years, the discourse on how to regulate AI has been very much focused on ethics as basically core set of principles which we could use. And this contributed to the emergence of principles such as accountability, transparency, um, fairness, for instance, in order to map out what AI could do in terms of harms. And I think this discourse has been really important because it mapped out certain, I would say, characteristics of AI, which tend to be problematic. AI uses a lot of data, which then leads to biases because the data in itself might be biased. Statistical models are too. At the same time, AI uses data, which means that the data it uses could be generated in a context of privacy violations. Um, and finally, we also have the loss of human oversight associated with the transfer of agency from human beings to those systems. And I think those are a kind of general, I would say, features we see that we can associate with AI. But I think like this addresses only one side of the story, namely in a way the linkage between technology and um, norm violations. But I think what uh, we also need to look into, and here also the human rights corner is very helpful, is to understand in what kind of settings AI is used. And human rights, they point here at specific areas which are more relevant than others. For instance, we have the notion of a right to health, which means that every individual has a right to an equitable like standard of health across the globe or some kind of basic line across the globe that we cannot structurally exclude individuals, let's say from hospitals, for instance. The same applies also to the so-called dimension of procedural rights, which are associated with uh, law enforcement, for instance, or also when it comes to the judiciary. So we have certain areas based on human rights, which are more important for individuals because they are protected specifically by certain human rights instruments or uh, normative concepts. And I think like the main issue what we are seeing right now is that people, when they look and deploy AI systems, do not consider like the specific requirements of those use cases. For instance, they say, okay, we use an AI system in education and then we use like a similar system in law enforcement without thinking about the specific implications the use of such a system might have when it comes to the specific area, when it comes, for instance, to issues, for instance, in health, like medical confidentiality. So if you use and generate data in the context of health, well, it has certain risks for individuals. If you think about, for instance, health records, which contain data about AIDS, for instance, or HIV or other diseases, which are also then tied to strong reputational effects on individuals, particularly in large parts of the world. So I think human rights in a way as an approach really help us to carve out the problem statement associated with AI, and not just from a high level perspective where we say, okay, there is an algorithmic bias, but also informing us when it, what it actually means for an individual that is confronted with that. Uh, so from that perspective, I see that um, human rights are indeed very important also to understand what kind of harms we can expect from AI. And I believe that owing to the fact that AI is not just a niche technology, but rather a comprehensive set of different technologies, we need to estimate that AI will influence all walks of life, which means that also in turn, it will influence all types of human rights. Because in the moment we use AI in across the landscape, it also is tied to different human rights, including freedom rights, quality rights, and also like rights such as freedom of occupation, for instance. So I see that as a major problem statement. Apart from that, I think there are also different ways uh, organizations and particularly companies might contribute to human rights violations. So by their own actions, for instance, by designing an AI system which is biased and deploying that in the context of health, but they might also provide other organizations with data or AI systems that then basically use those systems in order to harm human rights. So this is also what we call in human rights language complicity. And I think this is still a topic which is not really addressed by regulation for instance, the EU AI Act, which is just trying to establish some kind of normative framework for the European Union. So I think like one driving motivation of our convention is indeed to fill those kind of gaps and to provide an understanding of what basically AI and human rights means from a global perspective, including issues such as the digital divide. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Lucia, move, moving away from 
individual human rights for a moment, not that they don't matter and, and not that they're not wrapped up in, in your research as well. But your research seems to be concerned much more about the broader social and communal shape of societies. And, and if I read your website right, and tell me if I'm wrong here, um, you seem to be working in a, a research cluster that believes that digital technologies can bring transformative social change. Can you tell us about this? How, how do you imagine how, I, I'm sure this is actually happening. Can you give us some examples of how this is happening and how do you see this happening in the future? Yes, maybe there is a mistake in the in the in the website, and I was I would change the word can by could, right? I mean, uh, digital technologies could bring about positive uh, social change. So um, starting from that, um, I think that nowadays the 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 current um, political public debate about AI is is being dominated by two main uh, perspectives views, which is on one side those who think that technology will replace human beings and it will um, entail the extinction of humanity as we know it. On the other hand, uh, the techno-optimists that think that um, technology is here to, to provide a solution to many of our problems. And I think that these two extreme views that are of course opposite, uh, they share one commonality, which is that they see technology, they see AI as something that it's external to society that impacts on human beings as, as, as passive subjects. And I think the problem with these two views is that um, they take away all the agency power from us individuals, human beings uh, that live in a society, right? I mean, AI as any other technology is always socially constructed and, and acts in social contexts. So if we start from this view, um, we realize that uh, it's on us to provide some kind of direction to AI development and, and AI uh, advancements. So going to the conditions that you were asking for, um, I think there are at least three main conditions that I can think right now. Uh, first of all, uh, Alex was speaking before about regulations and, and governance frameworks, and, and I think that we need to continue working on, on better uh, regulatory frameworks and, and better governance frameworks, maybe not more, but maybe better, um, to improve, of course, the democratic oversight of AI systems, but also to avoid or, or mitigate the, the, the risks. And of course, here there, there's a lot happening um, at, the, at the national level. Of course, we have uh, the, the United States, the executive order of President Biden last year, at the European level, the, the AI Act, um, the Council of Europe, of course, it's also working on a, on a convention of, of AI, um, but also at the national level. I mean, uh, we have, and, the, and at the national level, when I speak about the national level, I also look at, the, at what is happening in, in other parts of the world, I come from Latin America, and in Latin America, many countries uh, are working right now on, on bills to regulate AI. Uh, Chile, Brazil have just presented uh, important AI laws. Um, but also at the global level, we have uh, the UNESCO recommendation uh, on the ethics of AI, which is quite important. We also have the OECD AI principles um, and, and so on. We have many things happening uh, out there and, and we will probably see much more in the, in the coming months and in the coming years. Um, but here, of course, uh, we have the, big, the biggest challenge, which is the implementation challenge, right? I mean, uh, it's very nice to have the, the laws, the strategies, the, the convention and, and, and the guides, but then we need to see how to implement it. And, and to implement it, we need both the human resources and the economic resources. And I think this is very important, not so much, not only for the EU or for the, for the United States or for China, but also for the rest of the world, for the, the so-called global South countries or the global majority countries also. Um, because then we see a big problem of copy, the copy and paste trap, right? I mean, we, we take, uh, we want to do something with AI because AI is moving so fast. We need to do something. So we go out there, we see what is happening out there in the world and we just copy the text of some strategy or some law and we, and we implement it in our local context. And of course, then we, see, we need to see how to translate these very beautiful concepts of transparency, accountability, trustworthy AI to the specific, specificities of, of each uh, particular context. So 
I was saying that the first condition is better and, 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 and more uh, governance and, and regulatory frameworks. The second condition, I would say it's more education, digital education, digital literacy, although I think that digital literacy is a, is a concept that doesn't, it's a little bit limited. It doesn't catch the, 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 the importance of this. I think we will have a panel on, on education afterwards, so I, I, I don't want to go um, much further on this, but it's important to bring uh, an informed citizenry uh, and an engaged citizenry to the debate, right? Um, and for this, of course, we need to ensure that AI technologies are able to everyone. And, and in this, the government and the private sector have, of course, a, a, an important role to play. But a little disclaim, disclaimer on this also, um, I think it's important to say what, what we shouldn't do on, on this. And, and I think we shouldn't leave this responsibility of bringing technology AI technologies uh, and digital technologies to everyone, just to the private sector and particularly to the big private companies. Because then we see things have, I don't know how much, how familiar uh, are you with the, the case of the free, free basics from Facebook in Africa. We can go further uh, on this afterwards, but then we see things like this happening and, and it's, it's a big um, challenge or, or risk. And the third condition, and I, and I leave it here, I think it would be to foster a, a broad, a plural, and, and an inclusive democratic debate on, on what AI means for us, on what AI uh, will be used for, and we, for which uses we will not use it, and, and why this decision is justified in each case, right? Um, and this debate, this democratic debate, should be a, a debate that goes over time. I mean, it, it needs to be a con constant debate. It, it shouldn't happen once uh, we bring to the table to all, all the stakeholders and, and then it's over. I mean, AI technologies are constantly evolving. So the democratic debate about AI technology and, and how it will impact our societies and, and, and which uses we will give to AI technologies should be a constant debate. I'll be there. Excellent. Excellent. No, the, and part of the difficulty is that the technology is moving so fast that we don't even know what's happening until it's in front of us and, and, our, and our ethical reflection is still months behind. Uh, that's very true. So Wallace, you've heard some challenges, you've heard some difficulties, you've heard some agendas. Where does Globe Ethics fit into this? You, you're the, uh, and, and your title is, is fantastic, the, the head of impact innovation and development. It seems like AI has to fall into your wheelhouse somehow. Where do you see Globe Ethics fitting in this conversation, including these panels, but, but beyond these panels? Well, when we look at um, uh, the uh, AI and digital ethics from a more systematic perspective, uh, we look at, um, let me start by saying that as uh, uh, the AI, it is, it is not an overstatement to say that AI is a game changer for human rights uh, from both uh, the risks potential harms and benefits. Uh, we look at, from, as I said, from a systemat systematic perspective, uh, not only uh, from designer, look at the whole life cycle of uh, AI, from design, development, deploy and use. Uh, we put it in the, uh, as economists like to put it in the like framework. We have three pillars from design, develop, deploy and use. Then the top, the roof is, is the governance. Ensure the governance is inclusive. Um, then the bottom, of course, is the whole financial business, uh, how is financing that. Um, but also uh, three dimensions uh, I would like to highlight when we look at, uh, do analysis, evaluate the, the AI implications for human rights. Uh, three E's, uh, effectiveness, efficiency, and equity. Uh, we see um, the, uh, uh, from our partner, from, from, for example, in, in the eff effectiveness part, to uh, look at the AI's contribution in, for example, the precision agriculture. So you can uh, water your, uh, your uh, agricultural uh, the pesticides, your fertilizers, will increase efficiency with your AI technology sensors, increase efficiency will reduce the pollution. Okay, in AI and education, it's hugely, hugely, uh, huge potentials there. 
to uh, increase access, increase effectiveness of, uh, of education service providers, particularly for uh, those who do not have access. access. Um, AI, AI powered health services, uh, the one of partner we had, uh, Jinzong Health is one of the example that provide uh, a, a tailored services with reduced cost. So that has increased efficiency, uh, effectiveness, and, um, and equity, I would say. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent. Alex, let me jump back to you then. We've we talked about human rights a lot. And before we before we leave the discussion, and, and we want to talk about human dignity as well as we go along and whether that's the same or different from human rights. But before we get there, um, this convention that we were have been talking about, what do you see as its future? Um, you're in the middle of working on it now. What's its future? What's its intention? What's the, the next steps as, as you think forward in this conversation? Thank you very much for this point. Um, so I think in general, there are two different ways we can look at the topic of AI and human rights. And I think the typical idea that how people approach it is to say, well, we have a new technology and we have human rights as a normative set and we use that in order to regulate the technology. I think this is one important argument. I think this is the one that we hear most often. I think there is also another corner. I think it is more the corner we come from actually is to say it is not so much just about regulating AI but also about maintaining human rights. And before I begin expanding on that, I think what we can definitely notice is that human rights as a concept is increasingly debated internationally. I would say that 70 years ago, where we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there was an international consensus, at least among the elites in the world to say that uh, human rights should be the guiding, I would say, normative principle for structuring the world, particularly after what we have been witnessing with the Holocaust, but also with the Second World War, and uh, also with the process of decolonization, which kicked in immediately after uh, the Second World War. And uh, from that perspective, we see that over the Cold War, I would say there has been like a debate on human rights leading then to the two international covenants and then also to its fusion in the 1990s, where we had this momentum of human rights really becoming, I would say, the core norm of international affairs. So far, so good. But I would say like over the past 20 years, we are seeing that we don't just have human rights as a normative concept, but also sometimes uh, ethical norms uh, that are used in the debate to regulate new technologies, et cetera. And I think uh, the purpose of the convention is also to make the point that human rights still matter as the normative foundation of international law on the one side, but also on the other side to say that human rights need to be in a way the basis of like one we speak about new technology, because if we right now don't have a convention on AI and human rights and basically just have like an AI convention internationally, or we say, okay, good AI convention, for instance, something that would be perhaps a bit more aligning international voices in sort of a minimum consensus, we would basically in a way deviate from the tradition of basically human rights based and centric frameworks. For instance, if we look at the close connection between bioethics and human rights, for instance. So the purpose of the convention actually is also to maintain human rights as the center of international regulation of technologies, but also of uh, resolving uh, problem statements, as it is already, in a way, clearly set out in the UN Charter, which explicitly reaffirms uh, or relates to human rights. So this is one important point. Uh, to mention. And uh, this in a way guides our approach when it comes to the convention. And it also has implications for the next steps because like with the convention, our aim is to inspire a debate on basically regulating AI from an international perspective. And this is needed uh, for several reasons. We see the debate with the EU AI Act where we have like first approaches that speak about, okay, this is what we want, bias is a problem. We have the GDPR addressing uh, privacy issues. But this is just in a way covering a certain part of the world, but it's not applicable internationally. To a certain extent through this, I would say, a digital space of the European Union, which extends national or European borders, but still it's not like really representative approach. At the same time, we have the convention of uh, AI, human rights, rule of law and democracy of the Council of Europe, 
but is again a framework which addresses rather human rights topics from a very European perspective. So if we look into the issues of rights of, um, let's say, um, for instance, um, different like nations across the world, the digital divide, if we look at vulnerable groups from an international perspective, uh, such as native tribes, for instance, this is not falling under the scope of uh, basically the European uh, convention approach. Um, so I believe it's very important, particularly when we look at the international activities of the likes of Facebook, Meta, uh, as they're called right now, or Amazon, uh, we need also to, to factor in the global dimension of that. So what happens, for instance, if Meta is using data from indigenous communities across the globe without asking for their permission and representing them in a wrong way? What happens if we have, uh, let's say, AI solutions in the health uh, in the health area, which does not uh, address specific issues that are faced by indigenous communities? And if we look into literature, we really say that it's decisive and makes a difference. And finally, I think there is another point to mention. Uh, what happens if AI is used, uh, for instance, in the context of the military? And here we have the linkage to international law. And those are issues which are not talked about from the perspective of the EU AI Act or from the perspective of, let's say, uh, the European Convention on AI Human Rights, Rule of Law and Democracy, because it's not in their scope, actually. This is also one of the key points. So uh, the issue of the convention approach we are having is to drive the conversation first and also to present our approach uh, to different international stakeholders, including the UN Human Rights Council, but also to go out to the international civic society, civil society and really to push that agenda and to leverage the convention as, as a concrete approach delving into dimension topics. Okay, that's excellent, excellent. And um, I wanna ask this question just as a quick follow-up. But I want to see you to answer this as well, um, because this, this is, to my mind, one of the more important questions as we as we get into this. The the UNESCO recommendations, fantastic document, probably in my mind one of the best ones out there. Um, but it just like the EU Act and in a variety of these other documents, when it comes to military, military or national security um, or defense, um, they all prescind from saying anything about rights. There's like that's not our prerogative. But then when you look at what NATO says, or you look at what some of what these other documents say about AI, the language changes from human rights to responsible AI. What's at stake in that shift? Is that a problematic shift? Um, and what do we do about that transition? Because I mean, looking at how, how AI is being used, has been used over the last months in, in Gaza. Um, it's been used very effectively for horrible ends um, by, by the Israeli army. I mean, that, that's pretty clear. Um, and they adjusted the algorithm depending on how many targets they wanted. Um, and they could find them and they could find them when they're at their softest. Um, human rights clearly not part of the narrative um, in justification here, but it could be construed as responsible. What do we make of that and how do we begin to address that? Alex, just quickly follow that up and then Lucy, I wanna hear, hear your thoughts about this. Okay. I think you are addressing like a very interesting question. Um, I would say that when we look at military operations, traditionally, they fall under the domain of international humanitarian law and not so much human rights law. And this is a very important distinction because we have the idea that we have this kind of uh, use in bello, like the, the law in war, uh, as, as mentioned. Uh, and this is in a way differentiated from uh, human rights, which is basically a guiding principle for a constitution of uh, nation states or the European Union, for instance. And uh, right now we have the understanding um, through, I would say, the um, uh, guiding principles on business and human rights that multinational enterprises in all of their operations need to consider human rights. And this is quite a novelty because it means that also enterprises have to look on human rights, whatever they are doing, which means that this opens the door to integrate human rights considerations also in military sector activities of multinational enterprises. And I think this is a very good chance in a way to have like a harmony on the one side between uh, on the one side, uh, for instance, international humanitarian law, which regulates warfare, and on the other side, the notion of 
uh, human rights. And I believe particularly in the case of AI, this is not just a coincidence, but it's really needed to look at the issue from those different sides. Because if we just apply uh, the logic of international humanitarian law, we we'll say, okay, you need to have like proportionality when it comes to, in a way, like estimating damage and harm in terms of civilian casualties and also military casualties, and that's it. So in a way it's mechanic, it's mathematical formula perhaps you could apply. Um, whereas human rights in that sense, given a specific nuance, also then pointing out at the rights of uh, vulnerable groups, for instance, and also having a more nuanced take on that. So I believe also here the fusion between those two things is very important. So on the one side, we see right now that AI is misused and, and used as a weapon right now. And we have uh, like the situation in Gaza ongoing, which is like a real, I would say, an alert to us. Uh, on, on what is going on and what also the consequence of AI use could be. But at the same time, I think it drives a very important point, namely that we need to have a closer integration of human rights on one side and on the other side, international law, and really to think about how to, how to close the gaps here. And I think that's one uh, that, that we should use right now, also the debate on AI and human rights to close this gap, which is not just about AI, but also about, in a way, like having a deeper understanding of what we should not do in warfare, particularly. Lucille, what do you think? I mean, just to add I, on, on what Alexander just said and, and, and military and, and security issues are not, are not my topic, so I don't want to, to extend on that. But I would say that AI technologies in Gaza, we think that they are being effective, but I mean, it's not that clear. Eh? It's not that clear. Um, so many false positives and, and we, we don't really know. Uh, that, that's what I meant by effective. Yeah, yeah. Eff well, yeah. Um, so the technology is out there, so we think that we need to use it because it will improve uh, the effectiveness of, of all of our operations and here security operations uh, go in, but it's not that clear. Also the AI Act, the UAI Act, uh, and, and Alex was speaking about the shortcomings. I mean, the AI Act, uh, at the beginning, it was supposed to, to, um, to prohibit uh, many of the, of the fresh air recognition technologies used in the public space. And, it started as something that was much broader, and at the end, uh, it has many, many, many limitations. I mean, all the the exceptions to the um, to the to the um, prohib prohibition of, of using facial recognition technologies in public spaces are huge. So there are many instances in which we could uh, say I had I had to use um, facial recognition technologies because of security reasons, right? So um, I think we need to change the locus of, of the conversation and, and, and start looking less on, on AI use as an as a, as a, as a, um, uh, instrument for, for war or for security, but also AI use as a technology for peace. I mean, uh, before uh, Professor Ka was speaking about all the uses for peace that AI uh, could have. And, and in the in the um, School of Transnational Governance, we also have a, pro a program which is called Global Peace Tech, which looks at all the uses for, for peace that we could give to AI. The problem is right now, all these uses for peace of AI are not uh, receiving the funding that is receiving AI for war, right? But just one quick comment on, on what Alex was saying before um, of the desirability of having universal frameworks for AI. And I think, of course, this is something desirable, but it's so challenging of, of, because of many things. And then we can speak far, further about the, the challenges of regulating AI, but mainly because the interests, but also the values uh, are not the same. So when uh, Europe is very interested about privacy, but many other parts of the world, they don't care that much about privacy. I mean, privacy is not a value per se in many communities of the world. Um, freedom of speech is not the same in, in the EU as in the US. I mean, we are, we are seeing it right now. So um, it's extremely challenging to arrive to a universal framework that at the same time, it's um, comprehensive enough to be respected and implemented. Okay, excellent, that, that's wonderful. Um, I have a quick follow up there before we jump back to Wallace then. Um, do you see AI changing European democracies in the next 10 years? Lucia, I mean, yeah, following up, following, following up on that, I mean, yes, I, there's certainly difficulties even making a generalization about European democracies and, and but globally is even, even harder, but the work you've been doing and, and, and reflecting on this, do you see AI radically changing or, or, or even marginally changing um, European democracies in the next 10 years or so? 
I think AI um, will probably change all the democracies around the world, not just the European democracies. And how it will change the democracy? Well, it will depend on the on the democratic conversation, right? What what we want AI to be used for, and and what we don't want AI to be to be used for. Um, this is exactly what we are trying to look at at the chair on AI and democracy, what I work on. So we realized when we started uh, this new project four years ago that uh, what was lacking for us was uh, a democratic uh, theory of AI, right? A democratic thinking of, of how AI will shape our democracies. So I think that if we think about AI, about democracy, not as something uh, stable, but it's, that is constantly un under construct construction and, and constantly evolving, then we can think about AI and not only as a threat, but also as an opportunity to maybe um, improve our democratic systems. So this broad conversation, broad democratic conversation that I was speaking before, um, I think eventually could lead to um, reimagine or rethink many of the pillars that are on the base of our democracies, right? I mean, equality, freedom, uh, human rights, citizenship. What does it mean to have uh, freedom in an AI mediated environment? What does it mean to be a citizen, citizen in uh, an, an AI mediated environment? All these things, I think we need to, to be really, really looking at them right now, not in a couple of years, right now. No shortage of challenges. Very nice, very nice. Wallace, um, <clears throat> we've been talking just briefly here about, about European democracies and, and looking back to what ambassadors caused comments and, and some of the things that have come up already. Global digital divide is a real thing, um, profoundly um, real. Do you see these benefits or even the, 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 the harms um, generated by AI? Um, dispersed globally in, in, in an equal sense? Or do you find that, or do you expect, and do you see uh, as, you, as you're working in this now, mm -hmm. that these things, the harms and the benefits are being unequally distributed like so many other things in the past? This is a very important issue, quite a, uh, the, the challenges of uh, equitable distribution of AI benefits. We look at, could be the three key uh, uh, perspectives first is uh, lack of access to technology because AI development AI deployment requires um, the access to high speed internet, uh, advanced compute, computing uh, capacity, but even basic skills. Uh, so the second challenge is um, the data sovereignty and inclusivity um, to ensure uh, the data itself because AI is mirroring the, the reality, uh, it's amplifying the, the inequality in the society, uh, also global level. If you do not get the data correct, uh, the data itself need to be inclusive. For example, the marginalized communities, minorities, if their data are not included fairly, so the AI decision, AI-based decision will be uh, uh, exacerbate this kind of inclusivity. So the access to technology, uh, data sovereignty, the third, third challenge I would say is a capacity uh, gap, a huge capacity gap um, uh, in terms of uh, investment, need investment in education, uh, capacity building, uh, particularly in underrepresented areas to ensure that the local, local communities can develop their uh, solutions, community-based solutions. I would say without this access to technology capacity building and the data sovereignty, there's a risk of extended uh, colonization in the AI age. Yeah. There's more and more bad news with AI. <laughs> let's let's talk about um, a couple of things and then um, building on what we've what we've already discussed, but but pressing further a little bit. Um, Human rights aren't limited to, say, freedom or, or, or the, the kinds of questions, um, freedom and, and freedom of speech and these kind of issues that we've discussed so far, but also um, one of the central themes that's kind of emerged in this conversation is that AI isn't merely about technology. It's about kind of the, the larger ecosystem it, it works in. And one of those realities is environment. Um, AI consumes profound um, amount of energy. 
Um, what does that have to do with human dignity and, and, and human rights or, or peace? Or is that part of a different discussion that we need to have? I suspect you want to have these integrated, Alex. And, and how would you think about that? You're raising a very important point. And to be honest, I'm very torn about this one. So I wouldn't say that I have like um, a perfect answer to that because I'm split between two different viewpoints here. Um, like one viewpoint is that if you speak about human rights, you address in a way like human interaction um, of individuals and human rights in a way are regulating those. So you have individual A, you have individual B and human rights are in a way like the space between those two individuals in terms of what they can do to each other and what they cannot do to each other. So in that sense, you have like a specific focus. How do human beings interact with each other as basically the primarily concern of human rights? Perhaps there's also like a difference to ethics because ethics also relates to in a way non-human beings in a sense of you have animal ethics. You have basically like the question of how to interact with the environment, how to, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this one point, like having a specific focus on, on human rights and tailing human dimensions in, di in a direct sense. Um, at the same time, we see that uh, the environmental damage caused by AI uh, also has consequence on human beings in terms of environmental destruction. And if we combine that with the consequence of the digital divide, we see that also the burden is primarily on the global south again. Uh, so if we look at the consequence of CO2 emissions, if we look at uh, basically uh, all like the energy consequence generated by, and it's not just CO2, but it's also about like using, consuming more resources eventually. Um, and we see that this is a major issue, particularly if we think about it from the perspective of the rebound effect. Um, so I think I'm, it, it's, it's a difficult question. I also believe that uh, in a certain sense, uh, the topics in themselves are very different. Like when we speak about human rights, it's very difficult somehow to put that into a mathematical formula. Um, like there is the human factor in it. Uh, the idea of proportionality, for instance. You have a conflict, for instance, on one side, freedom of speech, and on the other side, human dignity. And uh, you have like the question of how to deal with fake news, for instance, or you have the question of how to deal with harassment and so on and so forth. And we often see that all legislation to a certain extent needs to strike a balance between those rights. The idea is to say, okay, well, we should not find a legislation which completely destroys freedom of rights. And at the same time, we want to have a legislation which preserves human dignity. So this is in a way like a gray area. It is very complicated. Whereas when it comes to environmental topics in a way, particularly if we have CO2 emissions, we're able to count that. So we have a mathematical formula and can say, okay, the more, like if we switch on, if you turn on the light, it consumes this and that amount uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And based on that, we can put it into a formula. And then in a way we can also develop some kind of international uh, mechanism in a way in terms of CO2 compensation and whatever. Um, around that. So we could put it in an economic formula. So I, I think there is like a point of, in a way, disintegrating those two topics um, in the sense of we are able, much more likely to find an international solution for the issue of environment and on, on the one side um, from a theoretical perspective and AI then in terms of human rights and AI because it is more fuzzy and has more cultural dimensions. I don't want to say that Again, the CO2 topic and climate change is easily dealt with because here we have also major different interests across the globe, but at least we can put it into some kind of, let's say a formula or let's say some sort of, I would say mechanism. It is much more easier to do that uh, from, from a principal perspective, I would say. Interesting. Lucia, would you have a similar answer or would you see this differently? I mean, I think I, there is a, a huge challenge on, on, on this idea of which part of the value chain of the AI systems we regulate, right? At, at which part of the, of the whole, um, I mean, AI is not just uh, the data that fits the algorithm or the data center. I mean, it's, it's the data, it's the algorithm, it's the infrastructure, but it's also human resources. I mean, the workforce that, uh, all these people that are working probably in, in global south countries uh, training the algorithms under very um, poor conditions, um, but also the uh, natural resources and, and the environment, as you were saying before. I mean, all this is on the basis of 
of AI technology. So um, I think it's very important that we need to stop looking at AI as something that it's uh, the cloud, right? Abstract, something that it's out there and it's just one thing. I mean, it's very tangible. We can we can see AI from which, from where it comes yeah. and, and it's something very complex. So we need to choose which part of AI we regulate and we need many different instruments uh, to regulate each part. And when I speak about regulate, I, I think about, of course, hard law, but also soft law, right? I mean, guides, principles, strategies. Um, and then we need coherence between all these instruments because if not, I mean, it won't, it won't go anyway. It's very good, very good. Um, let's, well, I'm gonna ask you this question then too, and, and, and feel free to defer to any of your colleagues if you, if you want um, here. But the, uh, the title for this panel, AI for Peace and Human Dignity. We haven't talked much about human dignity. We've talked about rights, we've talked about um, harms, uh, benefits. Where does human dignity fit into this conversation? And, and is this maybe not, um, maybe not as cut and dried and normative as, as Alex would like, you know, likes in the human rights bit, but is, is, it's a fuzzy concept in, in many ways. It's broad and narrow depending on who you're talking to. Where do you see this fitting into this AI conversation and, and, and why would human dignity be important? Uh, the, the human dignity is is a foundation, uh, foundational concept. Well, uh, human rights, I think, human rights law, or human rights conversation grows. This is the, this is the foundation. This is the root. Um, I think another challenge uh, uh, we want to bring the human dignity into today's conversation about the future of AI is that. Uh, to some extent, the discussion of human rights is politicized um, in the international uh, arena, unfortunately. And uh, human dignity is a, a concept perhaps better perceived. So this is the, the two sides of the same coin, I would say. The ultimate goal is the same, to advance human rights, advance human dignity, because ultimately, we want an AI which is supportive of human rights and of human dignity. We may, in different regional contexts, we may use different phrases, but I think they are the same thing. Thank you. That's good. That's good. Alex, would you agree with that? So actually, yesterday, we had a debate about a topic. So over the night, I could spend some time thinking about it, actually, <laughs> which was good. So, so I had some time for preparation, actually. And I thought very much about like about the first time when I was confronted with the concept of human dignity. And it was when I was reading Kant because Kant has this categorical imperative as his foundation of ethics, which means that in a way you should always, if you treat someone else, you should always consider that becoming a universal law. So in the moment you steal something from a person, you give basically the permission to everyone else in the world to steal also from you and from everyone else. That's like the first part of his formula, but he also made a second, or he created a second part of the formula, uh, which is in a way the second categorical imperative or the second version of it, which means that you should never treat an individual as uh, basically a means to an end, but always as an end in itself. And I think like the wording of that sounds a bit complicated. I think it makes it makes sense to break it down is basically don't treat someone as a tool. So what does treating someone as a tool mean? You don't give value to the tool in a way, you just play around with that and you don't consider the tool in itself. And I think that's a very interesting take when it comes to AI, because a lot of topics that are dealt with are very concrete. For instance, when it comes to harvesting data from individuals. So in the moment you have basically an enterprise that collects data of individuals without them knowing that, for instance, um, they are basically making money and profit as a result of that, but it doesn't create an added value for the counterparty. So I think like the concept of human dignity is very helpful in basically understanding those situations because it allows us to understand to say, okay, human dignity means that whenever we use AI, the ones uh, whose data we use, for instance, the ones that are exposed to AI should have a benefit on that. And also that means every concrete individual here, 
Because the point that Kant wanted to make is that uh, based on the idea, don't treat someone as a tool, you have a strong argument against torture. So this idea of human dignity applies to prisoners, for instance. It applies to individuals that are accused of serious crimes. It even applies to dictators at some point. Uh, so the point is that we have like an absolute limit as a result of that, and that we have this idea of everything we are doing with AI should basically be conducive to every individual, like every real individual in this equation. I think that's an important point. So I think this is just general formula approach, perhaps by Kant. But I would say that also human dignity implies absolute uh, limitations of AI use. Uh, we have a tradition to say that torture is something bad because it basically means that you treat in this moment the individual you're torturing as a tool, as a means to an end, for instance, to generate more information and so on and so forth. So we had those debates, uh, I would say in popular culture when it came, for instance, to waterboarding and when it came to Guantanamo and the likes of that. And this is one point. I think there is also an important precedent when it comes to AI, for instance, the use of lie detectors. So in the case of using AI in the form of a lie detector, it means that the value of the person is reduced on the other side because you just have the purpose to find out the truth. And here you are really deeply going into the private space of a person. So I think the idea of absolute red lines when it comes to AI use really is very much tied to this notion of human dignity. And I think this links up to uh, what we call prohibited practices in the EU, EU AI Act, that we shouldn't use AI to exploit individuals with disabilities, or we shouldn't basically exploit weaknesses of individuals through data generation. For instance, when we find out that a person, I don't know, has a certain preference for products because they are lonely, for instance, and we use this kind of like indicator, we see in a data set that the person feels lonely, and then we use that in order to have a strategy for advertisement, for instance. So this is very much, I would say, in spirit of, uh, in, in spirit of violation of human dignity. So I think like apart from overarching human rights consideration, there is a specific emphasis on human dignity that implies also prohibited areas of AI, but also like some kind of underlying idea of when should we use AI at all? Well, it needs to have an added value for the ones that are exposed to AI and the ones whose data we use in order to facilitate uh, a system. So that would be my conclusion on that. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Let's take this language further then. Like I've I made a little bit of fun of the use the language of responsible AI earlier. Um, and and another, I mean, some one of my colleagues is, is a Center for Responsible AI um, working with businesses. They want to call it responsible AI instead of AI ethics because AI ethics seems to be bad for business. I don't I don't understand how that works either. But the, the language of responsible AI seems softer and 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 easier to get around. But Lucia, given kind of the a social kind of ecosystem in which AI works, might there be good reasons and with human dignity as, part, as an example, where responsible AI might be good language? Um, and, and might that be good language in place of, say, human rights, um, if we think of these things as, as social? Um, I think that's, that's a question probably Alex and, and Lucia could, could answer. Um, Lucia, do, do you think responsible AI might be positive in some of these ways? I think that we, I mean, we don't need to turn uh, the language softer for, for the private sector and, and business and companies to be happy with it. I mean, uh, Alex probably uh, have, I mean, he have been working with uh, companies uh, much more than me. So maybe you, you know uh, what are the internal discussions about this, but I mean, I don't see a problem with, with ethics and, and I mean we can use both at the end what we are discussing is, is the is the same right is, is how to make technology um, uh, uh, serve the, 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 the human well-being and, and social well-being so after many decades of an unregulated environment I mean we have seen uh, a few tech companies uh, make huge amounts of, mo of money and, and power that uh, we haven't seen uh, before in history. So, and of course, I mean, I don't say that these companies need to think about uh, human well-being and, and social well-being, but um, we are seeing that we need to guide these technologies, uh, advancements and, and technologies development. I mean, we, if we don't put some kind of direction and then ethics or responsible or, or trustworthy, and at the end, it's, we are discussing the same. Yeah, yeah. So Wallace, you've been thinking about this for a while and now after this conversation, um, 
let's imagine Globe Ethics had unlimited amount of money, hypothetically, hypothetically. <laughs> what would you want to use that money for in relation to AI? Give us, give us a vision for what, what could be done positively. It's, it's a really good problem to and, have. And, and no pressure. <laughs> That's it. Yes. I, first, I would say um, no single organizations can solve these uh, issues alone. And that's why we have good partnership with, with two, with Oxford University and uh, Baylor University on human dignity, human rights, with UN, uh, UNESCO on inclusive. Uh, AI. But actually, we started the conversation uh, with Stephen uh, and uh, your assistant director general in, in, uh, alongside the UN General Assembly last year. The thing is there is a huge need to operationalize uh, the principles, policy recommendations, for example, from UNESCO, from OECD. So I would say there might be two, if, if we have unlimited resources, um, I think two interlinked priorities, the principles and policy guidance um, including through conventions, through guidelines for public sectors, for private sectors, uh, for you know, civil society organizations, for universities, education sectors. So need to be more, uh, more practical um, guidelines, toolkits, because the principles, uh, the policy recommendations are already there, agreed by governments. So this is also the demand we, we got uh, from, from UNESCO, we also have conversation with the Interparliamentary Union, ITU. This is something we're going to continue to do with, uh, with uh, partners and stakeholders. The first is operationalize. The second thing is to, to really fill the, the, the capacity gap. We have, uh, uh, we have a blessing from our executive director, Fadi Dao, uh, to, to, to invest uh, initial funds on uh, global consortium. Uh, civil society organization consortium uh, to support, to empower civil society organizations alongside the academic institutions and private sectors to become the change agents in their own society, particularly from Global South. So they, they are empowered, then they will uh, contextualize their, their services to their policymakers, their parliamentaries, their private sectors. So that will lift up the capacity of the whole society and then they participate in international policy debates. So to conclude is this interlinked priorities of operationalization and consistent capacity building globally. Thank you. Excellent. You forgot to start with, I'd ask ChatGPT what I should do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, Lucia, if you, if you had the same opportunity, unlimited funds, what agenda do you think you would want to pursue or, or ought to be pursued? Um, I, I think I need to, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, just building on, on, on what Wallace just said, I, I think that uh, there is a need, and then of course, I, this is not my job. I, I, I look at uh, AI and democracy, but democracy also implies the, the private sector and, and, and companies. And I think there is a huge need nowadays of developing a, a business models for, for digital technologies to respect privacy, to, to respect human dignity, to respect human rights. I mean, the business model of digital technologies nowadays is based on surveillance technology and surveillance capitalism. If we want to discuss this concept, we can discuss this concept, but it's basically based on that. So of course we cannot ask a uh, Facebook meta, um, whatever company you you call it um to respect privacy if they are making money if the the entire in business model is based on the extraction and the use of human data so i think there is a huge need on that and then we need to redirect investments uh, from this hype on gen ai on generative ai all the money is going there right now <clears throat> we need to redirect this investment to and um, uses of AI for peace, uses a, of AI to strengthen democracy and uses of, of AI to empower individuals. Excellent, excellent. Alex, you know, the, you know what's coming. What about you? Unlimited funding, what agenda do you, would you wanna see pursued? 
Okay, I think like it connects a bit what you have been saying and also like the, the point about the convention. Um, I think like we see right now um, over the past, I would say decades, the emergence of powerful private entities in the AI ecosystem and also when it comes to data. And I think one critical point is that the business models they are having are have been very unclear perhaps in the beginning. So it's not a traditional business model in a way you sell a car and you make revenue out of it, but you are basically generating data and you use advertisements. So it's a bit more fuzzy. And I think this is in a way the crux of the matter because the, the business model strategies in a way are in a way conflicting with, with basic human rights. So I believe one important point is indeed the democratization of in a way, um, the ma major entities in, in the AI ecosystem, because otherwise I think because of the very inherent business model structure, it will be difficult to make them adherent uh, to human rights considerations. What, what democratization exactly means is a difficult thing, particularly if we have a global community, but I think this is some direction I would basically try to put resource into, particularly I would say when it comes to uh, shareholders, for instance, the Norwegian pension fund or others that would have like a decisive influence in, in really determining in a way the, the, the policies of those companies. So if I would have unlimited resources, perhaps like uh, in building an investment fund, which starts to invest in, in the ones likes of Microsoft, uh, Meta, uh, Tesla, in order to enhance in a way shareholder pressure on the CEOs of those companies to meaningfully implement uh, human rights and to, to change in a way this kind of infrastructure. And apart from that, I think like really investing money to have a debate on red lines of what we should not do in terms of AI use and, and to really have like strict minimum lines. Perhaps there are just two or three minimum lines that we have internationally when it comes to that, but at least to have something out there which uh, prevents the worst. So that would be perfect. Yeah, no, no, that that makes sense, and I wonder if good governance could could do some of those things too. You wouldn't have to incentivize it. Um, that's very good. We have two minutes left, um, three minutes left. I want to give you each a chance in like thirty to forty five seconds to sum up what you take to be the most important element of AI and peace and and and, uh, and human dignity from your perspective. No pressure, but you have like thirty seconds, and we're going to start with Wallace. <laughs> Well, AI is uh, definitely a game changer for uh, peace, human dignity, human rights. Uh, to maximize the benefits and reduce, minimize the harm, I think requires investment uh, in a close the digital divide and the capacity gap. Thank you. Alex. So I think it comes down in a way to the purpose of human rights. Um, I think the purpose of human rights originally was in a way to contain power. So the idea to say that we have rights as a space which secures us from others in a way encroaching in our freedom and also in a way encroaching in our human dignity. I think this is in a way the original meaning in a way philosophically speaking of, of human rights and it in a way ties up to, to the preservation of peace. And I believe that AI is a technology which really fundamentally reshapes power dynamics in our society. And I think we are experiencing that every day. So I believe that human rights as a principle, but also international law and not just human rights, human rights in, within states and across international business operations of companies on one side, but also international law when it comes to how states are interacting with each other and how they are using AI and weapon tools. I think that's decisive. So those are the two points I believe that are the most important in this corner. Excellent. Lucia, you have the last word. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, no, I think that we need to, as I was saying at the beginning, that we need to move away from these two extreme views because I think that the, both the techno-optimist and the techno-pessimist views are, are serve the, the interest of, of just a, some uh, big tech players, right? So we need to see AI as what it is, which is an opportunity, of course, but also a huge challenge. And, and, and the challenges are not uh, long distance challenges. We are seeing the challenges right now. We are seeing the risks right now. And, and recognize that it's on us um, to give direction to AI development. Thank you all. Colleagues, friends, join me in thanking the panel. Thank you so much to our panelists and our excellent moderator. You will